Praise God. Well, um, I've got a couple of bits of news for you. One is that uh, the next few weeks we've got some guest speakers. Uh, that'll be exciting and it's worth turning up for. Terry and I are uh, going to Australia this week to see family and catch up with family. And then we'll be back to hear how it went. So stay tuned because there's good things for you. Amen. And um, for those who were praying when I was uh, in hospital sick, thanks for that. And uh, the problem, I think, is fixed. Although long term, they're going to remove my gallbladder, which is such an exciting thought. <laughs> Come anywhere. <laughs> um, anyway, I heard a story that I might, might make you smile. I hope it makes you smile anyway. So a mother who was at her wit's end with two little mischievous boys and they were well known for it. Anytime there was trouble, they were usually at the bottom of it or part of it or something. And one day she just had enough. These boys are driving me nuts. So she took them one at a time to see the pastor. And the pastor's like, well, what do I do with these little darlings? An awareness of God, that's what they need. They need to think about the fact that God is watching them all the time. That's what they need. And so the first little boy sat there and the pastor looked at him in silence and said, where is God? And the little boy looked startled. And the pastor waited and said, where is God? And the little boy looked really shocked. And the third time the pastor said, where is God? The little boy got up and ran home as fast as he could and grabbed his brother and said, God's missing and they think we did it. <laughs> so, so I want to uh, start with a word of prayer and, um, and let's pray. Uh, and I encourage you right now, uh, including those who are watching, I'm, I'm looking at the numbers in the services today, realizing and hoping that there's a whole bunch of you watching right now. Um, and for those who aren't normally here, welcome to you as well, and we pray that you'll turn up as well. We'd love to meet you in the flesh. But let's pray, whether we're watching on a screen or sitting in the building, and open our hearts to God for a moment. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes, look to God for a moment, shut out the distractions and the things of this week and say, Lord, I want you to minister to me. I want to walk out of here. The, the presence and the power of God in this building is very real. The presence and power of God is right here now. So let's take advantage of that in a sense of opening our hearts to the Lord. And just in your own heart, let there be a cry that says, I want you. I want your touch. I want you to speak to me i want you to do a thing in my life in you know, i don't know what he will do but i'm confident that he's in the process right now of doing stuff for some people he's breaking sickness right now in jesus name right now so you know you, you know i'm talking to you or oh, i don't know who i'm talking to but you've got that witness right now father Fill us with the power of your spirit like we've never had it. Speak to us, touch us, comfort us, strengthen us, heal us, deliver us, bring us wisdom and revelation in Jesus' name. Whatever it is we need and whatever you see that we need, our hearts are open before you. So touch us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to speak today about building your safe place. And I'm hoping it's a good message because, uh, Karina, you're still here. So... Um, second time around um, building your safe place you know safe places are really important I was talking to somebody a while back and they were saying how their wife had become an alcoholic and they ended up with their own bedroom and then they had to put a fire door with locks on it because their wife would just let people in and they'd woken up a couple of times with drug addicts in their bedroom looking down at them while they were sleeping that doesn't feel safe does it I think we all like a safe place to sleep. Am I right? And we like a, we like a safe place, to, like our home, we would appreciate if it's a safe place. We often put a bit of time and effort into making it the space that we're comfortable with, that we enjoy, that we like being in, that we can truly relax, we can just be ourselves 
it's a safe place and we would like to build our safe places. Our home is one of the best probably for us, but, and where I sleep obviously is part of that. But where I work, we would like that to be a safe place. Where I shop, that would be nice to be a safe place. Uh, where I retire, you know, we have invest a lot into making retirement a safe place. We pay decades of national insurance. We also pay into pension funds so that we can have a safe place when we're too old to earn enough income to cover our needs. Safe places are good, aren't they? Unconsciously, we're all, all of us have been involved in creating safe places. But they can cost. Sometimes like our home or a retirement plan, safe places can cost. We've watched things like the war in Syria with people living like us, having their homes and their cities devastated. And we're seeing the same, obviously, this year in the Ukraine as well, where people like us have lost everything. They, they were living happy lives, going to work, coffee shops, shopping centers, having, having great modern life, and now it's all rubble and half their families are dead. And it sort of brings it home to you, man, a safe place is a good place to be. But what do you do when all your circumstances are against you? What happens when you lose your home, your retirement plan, and any other thing that makes it a safe place for you? What do you do? Can, can we have a safe place in all the circumstances of life? What if everything material was stripped away? What if uh, we're like, well, where do I find a safe place? You know, when the worst stuff hits our life, when we're trapped in a terrible situation, where do we find a safe place and how do we find it? Now, most of us here are followers of Jesus, am I right? And most of us who are watching on screen, I suspect, are the same. So our example, our leader, the one that we follow, uh, he's the boss of our lives, but he's the one with the best ideas on how to build a safe place. Um, he's the only human being who was ever perfect. He is the only human being to overcome death all by himself. He's the risen Lord who can help you find a safe place no matter what the circumstances are. And when Jesus was trapped in the most awful circumstances of his, exi of his entire existence, he showed us how to build a safe place. It was a continuation of the practice of his life on earth, um, but it made a difference every time. And I want us to read it together in Luke chapter 22. So if you've got a Bible, please turn with me. If you're at home, um, I'm sort of hoping you've got notebooks, Bibles, concordances, and a cup of tea. Luke chapter 22. Let me know if you found it or whatever. Good. We're going to read from verse 39 of Luke 22. This is about Jesus. Coming out... He, that's Jesus, went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed. As he was accustomed. Oh, this is normal practice for Jesus, right? And his disciples all also followed him because they were used to this too. When he came to, to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. In Mark chapter 14, verse 36, Jesus said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. You know, Jesus faced the awfulness of his situation. He was about to be executed in one of the cruelest and most uh, shameful ways known to man. But it was more than that. It was, it was, uh, there was a whole package of how it affected him. And obviously there was 
floggings and all sorts of humility um, or things being forced on him. But instead of letting fear overwhelm him or sink into despair or, um, or just be overcome by it, he dropped to his knees and he engaged in a very familiar spiritual exercise, a very familiar spiritual discipline. He didn't just go, oh, it's all too much. He had an accustomed way of dealing with things. He knew how to build a safe place. He had built the safe place. And he had often explained as he went through life with his disciples and was teaching them, he often explained that he was here on earth to do his father's will. He often explained that he did nothing except his father's will. Uh, and we know, if, for those of us who've read the scriptures, that he often drew aside to spend time with his father. And we've read in that scripture where he was accustomed. It was normal practice for him to do, do. And, and he built this safe place. He was about to undergo the most difficult struggle of his entire life, not just the crucifixion and the suffering physically, but he was dreading something even worse. Because we know from Matthew 27, 46, that Jesus would be forsaken by the Father for the first time in eternity as he took on your and my sin and death for us. As he withdrew to a dark and secluded hillside in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus knew what lay ahead of him. And as a man of flesh and blood, he didn't want to do it. I think we can relate to that, can't we? He didn't want, you know, as a man of flesh and blood, it's like, why would you want to go through and suffer the most horrifying physical torture of death by crucifixion? And as the Son of God who had never experienced any det detachment from his heavenly Father, his loving Father, he could not fathom the impending separation. It was a horror to him we cannot fully comprehend. So Jesus went to his safe place. A place where you and I can go. Jesus often went there and it was the way or the key to all that he did and all that he achieved. It's not a safe place that relies on things. You don't need material possessions. You don't need to be clever. You don't need to be educated. You don't need uh, money. You don't need your own home. You, don't, you, don't need, you can be without everything and still you can build your safe place and it's a place of incredible power and incredible grace. It's, so Jesus prays through this thing of not my will, but thy will be done. Now he doesn't, it's not some little religious exercise where he goes, oh, not my will, but your will be done. Da -da 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 -da. That's not how it worked. He was really wrestling with this. This was a process. This was an agonizing time of prayer where he was really wrestling. And, and you and I, are we followers of Jesus? Then maybe we should follow Jesus and take on board his practice of building a safe place where he wrestled with this thing. And we know that he was, you know, we, we read about the stuff and we know there's a rare uh, stress condition where you actually start sweating blood. Um, it usually is a very extreme stress and pressure and pain and suffering. And we know that he was in this intense conflict. And he asked the father to remove the suffering. Like, I don't want to do this. I really don't want to do this. But then he surrendered, not my will, but your will be done. In Jesus' worst moment, he went to his safe place. And in your worst moment, you can do the same. I can do the same. Um, and like Jesus, maybe there's times when you'll be under pressure, but the, Jesus did this. This was a habit. This wasn't something that just suddenly he was in at the place of the cross and just went, oh, I better pray through this. We, we already know he was accustomed to doing this. His disciples were accustomed to this. He would go out and he would wrestle with this stuff and he would pray and he'd say, Lord, you know, I'd really like this, but I'm not sure you do. So, uh, can I give it, you know, can I hand it over? Should I trust you? What do I do? And so wrestling with it and coming to the place where he got to that. He did it in the ordinary everyday life when there were no pressures on him so that when the pressure came on, he'd already built the safe place. Does that make sense?
He already knew he was accustomed. He was familiar. This was not an unusual thing for him. He just went straight into his safe place. And it's a spiritual discipline. And I encourage you to be accustomed to drawing aside and building your own safe place. In bygone eras of the church, it was normal for people to set aside time to wrestle through this issue with God in prayer, to really get their hearts in the right place, to keep it current, to keep it up to date, to keep it so that it was fresh and alive in everyday life. Not my will, but thy will be done. Wrestling that through. It's not a statement. It's a, it's a description of the end result of a process. It's a description of what God is doing in our lives and in our hearts. And if you're a follower of Jesus, my encouragement is let's follow Jesus. He set aside time. So why don't we do the same? When was the last time, do you remember, when you engaged in this spiritual discipline that Jesus said, follow me into of really wrestling with not my will, but your will be done. When was the last time you did that? Because let me tell you, when you do that, you connect to the power of God. When you do that, you connect to the provision of God. When you do that, you are putting yourself into a completely different place and uh, you, you go beyond where you're at. You know, As Jesus went into his safe place, an angel came to minister to him. As he began to pray, as he began to wrestle, God began to answer. Things began to happen. And when we work through, not my will, but your will be done, we leave our limitations behind and step into the glorious magnificence of the power of God. We look to the Prince of Peace when peace is long gone from our hearts and we get peace. We face our challenges in the power of an almighty God and not in the weaknesses of our own flesh. For many of us here, it's almost hard for you to comprehend this idea because our worldly thinking, our fleshly thinking is all about what I know, what I understand, what my experience is. But my encouragement is dare to lift your eyes and see that God is with you. God is good. God wants to make a difference and that he is the one who can bring you the protection. He is the one who can bring you the provision. He's the one who can bring the deliverance. He's the one who can bring the comfort. You're not alone. You're not meant to live life alone, and you're not meant to live second-class citizens of the kingdom of heaven. You're meant to be the number one citizens. You, you, you understand what I mean? God has our best interests at heart. He wants us to live our best. He wants to live us our, you know, into the, the things that he's designed us for, created us for. We all have purposes in God. Building your safe place with God is well worth the investment and it will change the course of your life. I love the fact that when you're wrestling with this, it's painful, personally, it's been a life-changing thing for me in my early days. But you step into something that you can't step into other ways. And the good thing to remember before I go on is that Jesus understands your pain and your difficulties. I mean, he went through incredible pain, incredible difficulty, incredible challenge and stress. His spiritual pain was much worse than anything we can even understand. So Jesus understands your weaknesses. Jesus understands your struggles. He understands our humanity. He knows that we're not perfect. That's why he died in our place. And we can cry out with every anguish or difficulty in our soul, just as Jesus did, because God can take it. He can take it. He's ready for it. So in this process of not my will, but your will be done, we lay down our stubborn, fleshly will of, oh, I did it my way. And we submit to God and we trust him. And if you truly trust God, you'll have the strength to let go of your wants, your passions, your fears, your insecurities, and believe that his will is perfect, his will is right, his will is just, his will is the very best thing for any one of us. And when we get ourselves into that place of not my will but your will be done, then we align ourselves with Almighty God, our Heavenly Father. We're totally connecting and under the authority of and under the ministering power of, which means we are under his protection, under his provision, under whatever it is that we need and have need for. We have access to his peace, his strength, his comfort, healing and more. In your daily time alone with God, I really encourage you to wrestle this thing through, 
Not my will, but your will be done. To really work that through in your own heart. And great discussion for Connect Group as well and to pray together. I want to give you a couple of scriptures before I come to an end. Psalm 18 verse 2. This is the sort of thing that David found because he built his safe place. You can build your safe place. You can follow Jesus and build your safe place. Psalm 18 verse 2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Hallelujah. What a powerful and wonderful scripture that is to remind us of this place we can live in. Proverbs 18 verse 10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Hallelujah. You could get excited about that, couldn't you? One of the scriptures that I believe should be a declaration of our hearts, and it's certainly one that I wrestled with when I first came to the Lord. You know, I read this thing in the Sermon on the Mount, it says, hunger and thirst for righteousness. And I thought, I'm not interested. Don't want it. And it was like, you know, I had to actually say, Lord, you better make me hungry for your stuff because I'm not particularly interested. <laughs> like that was my battle. And it was that part of that battle of not my will, but your will be done. It was part of that whole process. And so I got to where Galatians 2.20 became like a thing that I, I spoke and I declared and I prayed it into my spirit and I read it in different versions and I tried to pull it apart and I tried to get a hold of it and I encourage you to do the same. And here it is. This is a great declaration for you and me. Galatians 2.20 I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Hallelujah. We can live in that place. I mean, 1 John 2.17 says, And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Most of us here know about the Lord's Prayer, even if we don't use it on a, a daily, weekly or monthly basis. And it's, it's, it's a series of principles of how to pray. That's my view. And in it, it says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done. We're meant to be familiar with the spiritual discipline of wrestling with my, not my will, but your will be done. The good news is that we connect to all that God has for us in a much stronger and better way. We're positioning ourselves like we can't any other way. And we're following Jesus because this is his practice. This is his spiritual discipline. And so I encourage you, we're going to pray in a moment, but I, I, I want you to think about building your safe place, that you become like Jesus whom you follow. I'm accustomed to the spiritual discipline of wrestling through not my will, but your will be done. Become used to it. Become familiar with it. Become like this is an everyday process for me. I mean, because we're all the same, right? We all wrestle with this kind of stuff. Not my will? Well, actually, I, uh, I remember Charlemagne, the great uh, Frankish conqueror, he, he was convinced that the gospel was truth and everything. And when they baptized him, he stuck his right arm out of the water. And they said, what would you do that for? He said, well, I want to surrender everything to God, but I still need my sword hand so I can go to war. <laughs> like, I think you missed the point, buddy. Not my will, but your will be done. But we all do that in some way. You know, we can, we can sound all very lovely, you know, not my will, but your will be done. Of course, I've still got my holidays booked and I've still got that hobby and I've still... <laughs> Don't touch my money, Lord. Do you know what I mean? We've, we've all got those battles. My encouragement is to build your safe place so that if the worst happens, you'll be okay. If the worst happens, it'll be a common familiar practice for you to step into the power of God, to step into the provision of God, to step into all that God has and that you need.
So instead of living within the limitations of what we know, what we see, what we understand uh, within the flesh and the, within the world, we are able to say, well, God is bigger than all that. And he's, he can actually do stuff. And I know for Terry and I, in our early years, it was dealing with the impossible that God used to help us to grow in faith and to get to the place where we could actually share the Word of God with others, of having to really, Lord, we have no hope here, but we're trusting you that somehow you'll open a door. And he used to do it. It's quite astounding. We should have written them all down. So if you're watching on the screen or in the building, why don't we just bow our heads for a moment and open our hearts to the Lord. Just shut out things around you. Think about taking on this familiar spiritual discipline that Jesus had. Be his follower. Decide to follow him so that you're wrestling with not my will, but your will be done. Father, I pray that your power would come upon every one of us, that you'd minister life to every one of us, that you'd help each one of us to be able to wrestle with this stuff like Jesus did. We choose to follow him. And in following him, we take on board this practice of building our safe place. That no matter what happens, like happened to him, something powerful happens, we pray. In Jesus' name. You know, while we're just in a moment of prayer, just think about this. Jesus came to accomplish something. And it was wrestling with not my will, but your will be done. And going through the pain and the trauma of what he had to go through. That was the key to him being the resurrected Lord of glory, resurrected in power, resurrected. Death could, cannot touch him. Hell cannot touch him. Nothing can touch him. He is the unparalleled victor because of this safe place that he built. Remember the end of the story, not just the pain of having to go through crucifixion and separation from his father and all that stuff, but remember... He is the resurrected Lord because his safe place was the key to getting there. So as we pray, Lord, minister that to us and to our hearts. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe you're watching on a screen or maybe you're sitting in the building and I, I don't want to judge. I don't know where everybody is at. I can't um, prescribe what's going on in your heart. But maybe today is the day to say yes to Jesus. Maybe today is the day to say, I will follow you, Lord. And if that's you, why don't you do that right now and say yes to Jesus. Make a decision. We'll have